Well, good morning. I'm excited about this message this morning because it deals with the subject that we're all here together for, and that's the area of worship. Worship. And if you've been with us in this series and the book of John, John chapter 4, we've been, Jesus has been witnessing, had been talking to the woman at the well. The disciples have gone away to get provisions. By a divine appointment from God, Jesus Christ, as it says in the Scriptures, must needs go through Samaria. He left Jerusalem because he had an appointment with this woman. And he's now having a discourse and a discussion with her. And for all, during the discussion, he brings out the fact of her past life. He brings out the fact that she's a sinner and she has had five husbands and yet the man she is with now is not her husband. And somewhat like a red herring or a way of diverting things, she brings up the subject, totally somewhat off-subject, okay, well, where should we worship? Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim, where the Samaritans were to worship. And I want you to look, if you would, there at verse number, uh, verse number 23, please. Verse number 23. It's interesting how she says that. It says in verse number 23, but Jesus says... But the hour cometh and now is, when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh to worship Him. For God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman said unto Him, in other words, she says, well, where do we worship? Jerusalem? are where the Samaritans worship, the false place, if you look at the area of truth, as far as the Old Testament is concerned. Cometh, it says, I know when the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, when He is come, He will tell us all things. In other words, when the Messiah comes, when Christ comes, He will straighten this out. Don't miss this, please. Look at the screen or look at your, at your iPad or whatever digital device you have this morning. Verse number 26, he says, guess what? I am he. You asked when he comes that we will find this out. He'll tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. I'd like to preach a message I simply titled this morning, True Worship. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the music. We thank you for the children's program. We thank you for the time that we've had together. And Lord, I pray you would bless this time around the Word of God. I pray that we would all be open this morning, that the Spirit of God would enlighten us to what true worship is. I pray for those that do not know Christ as their Savior this morning, that they can come to an understanding what true worship is through salvation, through Christ and Christ alone. Guide and direct, fill me with the Spirit this morning. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen and amen. The subject of worship, nine times, ladies and gentlemen, Nine times is the word worship present in this text. Nine times it comes up. Through the discussion of worship, Jesus brought, <clears throat> through the discussion on worship, Jesus brought the discussion through that that he was the Christ. In verse 26, he identifies himself as the Messiah. I that speak unto thee am he. Now we've seen in this text, verses 1 through 15, Jesus reminds, or excuse me, tells the woman that he is the living water. And he offers the Samaritan woman at the well. What he offers the Samaritan woman at the well. And she totally misunderstands what he's saying. We see in verses 16 through 19, 
Jesus, somewhat like a surgeon, surgically penetrates and lays bare her soul of knowing who she is and what her present condition is. And he says, you've had five husbands, but yet the man you're with, not, with now is not your husband. Very convicting. And then the woman, out of nowhere, trying to change the subject, as I said, as a diversion, maybe a diversion, but it did not divert Jesus. He had a plan. He knew what she would say. Brings up the subject. Oh, by the way, you have five husbands. You've had five husbands. And the man you're with now is not your husband. And then she goes, oh, where do we worship? Well, where did that come from? Well, we'll find that out this morning. Now, when you look at the word worship, it really means to properly kiss the ground. It means to prostrate yourself before deity. To fall down. To adore one on one's knees. And see, what we have here in the text, we have a Samaritan whose beliefs, whose false religious system was worship in old Mount Gerizim. And the Jews, as you know from the Old Testament, worshipped at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So there was mass confusion between the Samaritans in the north and the Jews in Jerusalem and the surrounding area. And that's where she brought the subject up, somewhat trying to get a question answered and possibly getting off the subject of her sin with her immorality, a sin in her immoral lifestyle. But let's remember, ladies and gentlemen, that the woman brought up the subject of worship. She brings it up. She's the one that brings it up in verse number 20, talking about her fathers in this mountain worshipped. The fathers worshipped in this mountain, but ye say, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And she's trying to get this ancient dispute settled while they're they're at the well in the middle of the noonday. Jesus answered, her questions. But when we think about the subject of worship, so many are caught up in the aspects of worship, they forget the object of worship. And the object of worship is God, or Jesus Christ. See, you can have all of the areas that most consider important in worship, but yet miss it. The music may be right, the building may be comfortable in a place that where tradition has honored the Lord and there's nothing wrong with that. The location. But you miss the object of the worship. Let me give you an example. My wife and I, when we were in Jerusalem several years ago, we went to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher there in Jerusalem. And this is the place that was built over one of the locations where they believe where the tomb of Jesus Christ was. And we walked into this church of the Holy Sepulcher. There was a slab there. And some would believe that that slab was actually the slab that Jesus Christ was on when he was wrapped up and put into the tomb. And when I saw there... Absolutely. In fact, it bothered my wife so much she had to leave and go outside of the church. Because we saw people there kissing the slab, wiping themselves, saying some type of a chant. And all I saw was all the aspects of what they were doing was worship, but failing to understand who Jesus Christ was. Chanting creeds. One person was actually hitting himself with a some type of it looked like a chain. Ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what Jesus Christ was trying to undo. And this woman wanted Jesus to define worship. 
So first of all, let's, like, let's take a look at, number one, the detour from worship. The detour from worship. The detour. Look what it says in verse uh, chapter 4, verses 20 to 22. Number one, the detour from worship. It says there, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know that what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. She raised a religious question. One that might steer the discussion away from her sin. A distraction, possibly. It's like sometimes when you're trying to explain the Lord and giving your testimony and talking about Jesus Christ, somebody will say, I understand all that, but where did Cain get his wife? Or as the aborigines, if they've never heard, will they also be accountable? See, worship is not limited to a location. In verses 20 to 22, to get away from his somewhat prophetic probing of her heart, the woman leads Jesus into a discussion about where should we worship? She wanted to talk about where. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but ye say Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Now he's leading her to a point of talking about only the Messiah knows. He'll answer that. And as we learn from the text, he says, I am. Am he. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a day coming sooner than you think when both mountains will be irrelevant, is what he's saying, for true worship. And he must be, the lady must be, the individual, the woman must be amazed to hear a Jew say that this not only will not the mountain in Samaria, but the Temple Mount in Jerusalem is not where worship will take place. Instead, it says, instead, where we worship, it's instead of where we worship, Jesus focuses on whom we worship and how we worship. That is what the point he is getting across. This is not the answer she expected. She expected a good argument that Jews defend Jerusalem as the focal point of worship and Samaritans will defend their mountain in Samaria, Mount Gerasim. But Jesus rejects the whole argument. Instead, He says, we're on the brink, now listen to this please, of something new. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will your father will you will you worship the Father. Now that must have blown her away to hear a Jew say that. Jesus, according to verse number 22, was firm in his declaration of the issues that were involved. The Samaritan religion was confused. And when he says there in verse number 22, ye worship, ye know not what we, what we know, what we worship for salvation of the Jews. The Samaritans were not the vehicle for salvation of mankind. Israel was the nation chosen by God. When Jesus said salvation is from the Jews, he did not say or mean that Jews, that all Jews will be saved. What he meant was, in a sense, is that salvation was available through Jesus Christ who was born of the seed of Abraham. But she was thinking, how can a Jew say a new day was coming and you will not worship at Jerusalem? Now let me tell you, that got her attention. Give me an example. During this crisis, we're not worshiping in a building. Most of you are in your living room or your kitchen or some type of a location in your house, but yet you have true biblical worship. 
Many said that this crisis we're going through, the church has left the building. The word church means a called out body of believers. Sometimes we as well get stuck in tradition of a location. How applicable is that to this morning? Secondly, let's look at number two, the description of worship. Now this is really good. And I hope you bear with me for a few moments. Look at verse 23, please. But the hour cometh, and now is. When the true worshiper shall worship the Father. Now don't miss this, please. We often quote this verse somewhat quickly without necessarily understanding and praying about its meaning. In spirit and in Truth. Now remember, he is dealing with the Samaritans who established a false worship, a false doctrinal system, a false sense of worship north of Jerusalem. And we have what we call the true worshipers, if you want to call them that, or excuse me, the Jews down in Jerusalem who were on the Temple Mount. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. What a description of worship. With the advent or the coming of the Messiah, the time came for a new order of worship. True worshipers are those who realize that Jesus is the true, is the true God, truth of God. The one and only way to the Father. John 3.21 says this, But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, and that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. John 14.6, many of you know, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. So true worship means a believer enters into the presence of God by faith and there praises and worships Him. Bow down and prostrate before deity, if you want to put it that way. He may be located in a den, in a prison, or a field, but his spirit can go, draw near to God in the heavenly sanctuary by faith. Now, yes, we believe in corporate worship, no doubt about that. I'm not trying to demean that. Jesus announced to the woman, from now on, the worship of the Father would be in spirit and in truth. Now, He had to debunk, undo. Everybody look here. He's got to undo two things here. Two things. He had to address two falsehoods that had taken place. The first was regarding the Jewish worship. The Jewish people had reduced worship, had reduced worship to outward forms and ceremonies. They thought that by religiosity, adhering to the letter of the law, and going through certain rituals, they were worshiping the Father. See that? But theirs was not a worship of the Spirit. It was outward, not inward. Their bodies might have bowed down on the ground, but their hearts were not right before God. Perhaps they were pressing the poor or lying or using deceitful business methods, but yet they were going through the formality and they were not, look here please, worshiping in spirit. How many of us are guilty of that? How many of us, ladies and gentlemen, have gone through the outward formalities and checking the boxes, but yet we're not worshiping in the Spirit? And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, he brought that up and said, it must be in the Spirit and in truth. Now, the Jews had, quote-unquote, The truth, that wasn't the issue. The problem was it was all formality and they were just saying something in an outward manner. Have you ever met somebody 
that you can tell what they say and what they do is not where they are. That's what he was talking about. They were more concerned with the outward rituals. Now, the second part of that is really, really good. He says there, the second part is not worshiping in truth. In truth. And he goes on and says, the Samaritans, on the other hand, had a form of worship, but it was false. It was false. Think about that. And they had no scriptural authority. They had started their own religion. Do we not see that today? They were carrying on ordinances of their own invention. Real worship had to be in truth. And the Samaritans were largely worshiping false rather than worshiping truth. They had a hodgepodge of religious ideas. At best, it was sterile. It was some hybrid of Judaism. It was lifeless. It was dead. And it was false. So Jesus Christ is debunking the the ritualistic worship of the Jews, and they just were going through the formalities, and he said that needs to be done in the spirit. You have the truth, at least in doctrine, but the spirit's not there. It's false. And then we had the false religion that was totally made up. And Jesus Christ says that we should worship in spirit and in truth. When the Lord said that the worship must be in spirit and truth, He was rebuking both the Jews and the Samaritans. He's not confined to any one place at any time. He's omnipresent. He's in everywhere all the time. He's all-knowing, all-powerful. Therefore, those who worship Him must be worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. There must be no sham or hypocrisy. There must be no pretense of religiosity or inwards, one outward presentation, but inward corruptness. There must be no idea that in going through a series of rituals, God is thereby pleased. And do we not find ourselves guilty of that? Let me ask you this. Even if God instituted those rituals himself, he still insists that a man approach him with a broken and contrite heart. Two extremes we find today. Formality and legalism on one side, and error and doctrine on the other side. And how Jesus Christ is addressing this with the woman at Samaria, at the well. Number three, the disclosing of worship. Now this is really good. So he says in verse 22, you worship, you know not what, that salvation of the Jews. Now look at verse number, excuse me, verse number 24 and 25, I'm sorry. 24 through 26. For God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And then we find something really interesting in verse 25. Look at the the words there. So the woman says, yeah, you're right. There is something, you know, you've brought up a good point, Jesus. You know who I am. And you brought up a good point because the Samaritans have this position and the Jews have this position. And then she says something. Look at verse 25. The woman saith unto him, I know the Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Here's what it means. Well, when we see the Messiah, he'll answer which one's right. Uh, excuse me. That's me. That's what Jesus is saying. So she actually leads Jesus Christ into... She, the, her question is answered by Jesus. What a wonderful discourse we have here. He says there, He will tell us all things. When the Messiah comes, when the Messiah, the anointed one, he'll tell us which one is right. And Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Something is happening. She jumps right into the Messiah, right? During this question. 
Eventually the woman had picked up maybe some echoes of truth in the past concerning the Messiah. She's starting to connect the dots maybe. She brought up the subject worship anyway. No doubt she'd probably heard of the preaching of John the Baptist and the Messianic hopes in Israel had been talked about in Samaria. She had some understanding along these lines and she voiced what she knew and believed. I know she said that the Messiah is coming, he'll, which is called Christ. He will, when He has come, He will tell us all things. And Jesus uses the words. In verse 26, I am, in the languages, that's what it means. I am Jehovah, who is the one speaking to you. I am unto thee. I am. I that speak unto thee am he was announcing a startling truth. A truth that the one was speaking to her was the Messiah from whom she had been looking for. He was the God. He was God Himself. He had revealed Himself to her at the well. So the question was, what is true worship? As we close, we see in this text, we see a couple of things that are interesting. We see the fact that the, the worship was disclosed. There was a disclosing of the worship. We also see in there, there was a description of worship. But more importantly, we see that there was a detour from worship. And Jesus Christ answered all of those. Now I want to look, I want everybody to look here as I get ready to close. God is working in your life. And maybe you could be like the Jews in Jerusalem that had all the formality. You know, you bowed down, you kissed the ground, you did all of the religious duties, but deep down, you didn't have true worship. Or maybe you're like the Samaritans. You've understood a false system that maybe even denies who Jesus Christ is. And see, Jesus says it must be done in spirit and in truth. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm asking you this morning, the way you have true worship is to cry unto God, come to His mercy, ask for His forgiveness and His grace that will fill your wicked soul. Ask for Him to come into your life and save you. That's how you have true worship. It's not what you do or what you don't do. And it's surely not found in some false system that we make things up as we go along. True worship comes as she found out in this text from the God-man, Jesus Christ. Let's all pray together, can we? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for this time. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I do pray this morning that you would give us the understanding of what true worship is. Lord, for some of us this morning, we have the rituals down, but we've never understood what it means to worship. Yes, we bow down, prostrate, in a sense, but it's all out of duty. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us this morning and help us to receive you by faith and faith alone. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would understand the necessity of true worship. In a minute, Iris will play, and maybe you just want to pray. And if you're not sure of your salvation... If you're struggling with sin, why don't you pray right now and ask God to reveal Himself to you? Or maybe you need to confess a sin this morning. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Lord, guide and direct.
as only you can. In Christ's name I pray, amen and amen.